All right, D Waters, but welcome back. Uh, we're so excited to be here and um, to be here with you guys out there in TV land. I keep saying that because I used, when I was little, they used to say, welcome everybody in TV land. You know, everybody might be watching me on TV. Anyway, so uh, we're starting this month with a new series on blame, okay? And today we're going to talk about blame who, all right, which is going to lead us up to a very interesting Easter sermon. Uh, because as I was, the Holy Spirit said, teach on blame. And um, Pastor Brandy said, so are you going to teach on blame on Easter? And I said, well, he told me to teach on blame. But then he gave me a few things on blame that are so perfect with Easter, as you hear today, that uh, it just lines up. It's got to be God, all right? So, Holy Spirit, we just thank you for leading and guiding us and taking us in this direction. Let our hearts and minds be open to hear and receive from you. Uh, and what we want to hear is uh, your type of conviction, because your conviction brings correction and you correct those who love. Um, but also, Lord, for your healing uh, in this situation and the release from bondage uh, for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today is just going to be a really good foundation. We just got to set some statements in place, and so we're going to start, start with that and just see where the Holy Spirit is going to take us, okay? Uh, so first thing is this. All right, just some statements for us to get out. Blame is an inherent and inherited state that is at the core of mankind. It is the inner essence of being of the heart of man. All right. Now, when we talk about blame, and, and many of us are, 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 have a lot of, what do you call, experience is a good word, with this word. That's a nice way of saying that. See, that was, that was a Holy Spirit good way of saying that. That's why I had to pause. That was a Selah for the Holy Spirit to say, be gentle, be nice, because I'm going to be gentle and nice. So we have a lot of experience with blame. Um, and we did not have to get taught how to blame. Blame was not something we learned. It was just something that was inherent within us to do. That's why it's at the core of mankind as we're going to keep talking. Blame is getting, now here, here's a powerful statement. Blame is giving someone or something undeserved credit. Blame is giving someone or something undeserved credit. They did not deserve any credit for the situation. But when the minute we blame somebody for it, we give them credibility over that situation, which is going to be powerful here in a minute. All right, let's keep tracking. Blame, now I love this statement, all right? Blame ties you in a knot with the situation and or the person you are giving the power to decide how you respond and your emotional state during and after the situation arises. So it ties you in a knot with the situation and the person, and it gives that situation, the person, power. It gives it actual power to decide how you will respond and your emotional state during and after the situation arises. When we blame, we declare that the situation that I am in, now watch this, I cannot or I will not overcome. And my only way of recompense is to give my emotional control of the situation to somebody else. Now, I, I, I bet we've never thought of blame that way. Because we figured, look, I just don't want to be in trouble. Or it really was someone else's fault. Okay, but there's a difference. We're not talking about fault. We're talking about the emotional situation that blame puts us in gives that person or the situation control. And it says, hey, they have control. I cannot get out of this without them relinquishing control over me. So until they come to the conviction of the heart, say sorry, whatever you want, I'm going to stay in this emotional knot and this emotional tether to that situation of person. Now, when, when you think about it from that standpoint, because well, as I was preparing this, I said, well, Lord, I got knots everywhere. Good God Almighty. Because cause I, I blame a lot of stuff, okay? But when I begin to, and, and here, here's the proof. All right, here's the proof. Here, here's the, the blame proof, okay? Because if you go through your mental Rolodex of experience in blame, and as you go through the list of names of people that you've blamed, your body will physically begin to respond as if that situation was happening all over again. That's proof that you have a knot there. It's like when you go to the chiropractor, you know, and they go down your back and all of a sudden they, you know, they hit a spot. Ah! 
Now, you didn't know it was there, nigga, it was tender right there, right? I don't, now, I don't know why they keep pressing it, though. That's the thing. <laughs> Once you say, ah, the first time, they should know, okay, don't do it again. But they just hit right there. You mean, is it right? Is it in there? Oh, I can feel that. I can, I can feel it, too. Okay, stop hitting it. But you didn't know it was there, but the minute they touched it, all of a sudden it's sensitive and it exposes the pain that was there. See, so, so if you go through your blame Rolodex, you'll find that those situations you're still emotionally responding to. That lets you know that there's a knot still there and that you were still tethered to that situation. Because if you weren't, then if somebody brought it up, you wouldn't have a problem. They'd be like, whatever. You know, it is what it is. Whatever. But because of that, because of that, you'll still be tied to it. All right, let's keep going. It's good stuff so far. Watch this. All right. Now, if we begin to take a look at the list of things we can often blame, the first one on the list is always the easy target. First one on the list is always the easy target, and that's the parents. Usually the first ones we'll go to is our parents, mom, mom and dad. Now, regardless of where you are in your parenting hierarchy, whether you are blaming your parents or your children are blaming you, because my kids be blaming me. Me and Brandy are great parents. Me and Brandy are awesome parents. Me and Brandy are off the chain parents. Me and Brandy are probably the best parents. Other teenagers would love to have us as parents. Other kids want us as their parents. Other kids are more grateful than my kids. Okay, anyway, I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm teaching on blame. I'm, t I'm, teach I'm teaching on blame. I have experience, all right? But no matter where you are in the hierarchy of blame, a lot of times we go to the parents first. Now, blame has nothing to do with right or wrong. Blame has nothing to do with right or wrong, because the first thing we want to think as a parent, I'm good, this, this, but it has nothing to do with right or wrong, because blame is always wrong. There, there is no good blame. Blame is always wrong, all right? And watch, I'll prove it to you. If you look up the definition of blame, you can just Google blame meaning. It's going to tell you to hold responsible or find fault with to hold somebody responsible or to find fault with or to place the responsibility for the fault on someone else, to put that responsibility on someone else. Now, the first time this was used, we all know, is in Genesis. It's in Genesis. And in the NIV, I didn't give you guys this, but if you could pull it up, Genesis 3, 12, uh, 12 and 13, really, is what we're going to hit. All right. And so we understand that Adam and Eve were put in the garden and and God told them you can eat from any tree in the garden except for what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, here's the thing that pe many people miss just missing this story. OK, there were actually two trees in the garden. There was the tree of eternal life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees. Now, because many people say, well, Adam lived in the state where he could live, to, live forever. Then he wouldn't have needed the tree of eternal life if he could have lived forever. Okay, I'll let y'all figure that one out later. So, but the tree of, and, I, and here's, and after they ate of the forbidden fruit, the angel had to come and put a sword around the tree of eternal life because God said, lest man stretch out his hand and live in a permanent state of death. They had to kick them out the garden so they wouldn't eat from that tree. All right, just so y'all know, y'all can study that, but that's where it came from. All right, so they had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And so the serpent comes to the woman and the man because the man was right there with her. And the serpent begins to talk to the woman while the man's standing there right there with her. Apparently, they've had conversations in the past. And so, and the serpent is all in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's all around the fruit. He's touching the fruit. And he's talking to them saying, hey, you know, can't you eat of any fruit in the garden? And she says, no, we can't. We eat of any fruit, but we can't eat the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the evil. And he said, no, God knows that if you eat of this tree, if you eat of this tree, you will be just like God. All right. So it says, uh, starting in verse 12, it says, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So when God goes, OK, he comes in the garden and Adam and Eve hear him walking in the garden. And when they hear him walking in the garden, they hide inside the trees. Right. That's that's, you know, y'all y'all seen the cartoon. OK. All right. So they hide in the trees. and They're peeking out through the little leaves. Right. And 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 God's coming through the garden and he says, Adam, where are you? And he said, you know, I'm naked, so I hit myself. Who told you that we're naked? He said, and then Adam begins to speak out because God said, did you eat from the tree I told you not to? 
And the man said, the women you put here with me now. All right. All right. All right. So God was the first parent to get blamed on by his kids. So us parents do not feel bad because they, his kids blamed him first. How dare they blame God? So the, so the first thing he said was, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So he blamed God and her. Now go to verse 13. So in verse 13, now, now God begins to direct his conversation to the woman. And in verse 13, you guys can put it up. Go ahead. Is it coming? Is it coming? Is it coming? There it is. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So she goes, okay, I, she's not going to blame the man, but she blamed the serpent. He deceived me and I ate. So then when God, now we're not going to do, because God goes to the serpent and he didn't even ask the serpent what happened. He just straight curses the serpent, boom, and everything changes, right? And so that's what, but that is the origin of blame. It's the, it's the origin of, of blame, okay? Now, let's keep going. All right, now, the second thing on the list, oftentimes, we as parents will blame our kids, children. We can blame children. We blame grandparents. We, blame, we will blame generational curses. You know, well, I can't because I've, that's been in my family or this has been in my family, so that's restricting me. So now I can't do this or I've never done that because of. That's still blame. That's, that's still blame, especially because Christ redeemed you from the curse. So if Christ redeemed you from the curse, then you don't have to operate under that curse anymore. So you can't even blame the curse. That's what we're going to talk about next week. All right. We blame our bosses. We'll blame siblings. Now, a lot of times I really did have a right reason to blame Corinne. I really did. There were a lot of times when it really was her fault. There were really times when she did stuff and said stuff on purpose, and she knows it. She's sitting here in church. She knows it. But anyway, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep rolling. All right. <laughs> Oftentimes, we'll blame society or the man or the government, which ain't nobody blaming the governor right now because everybody about to get that check. All right. We went through a huge phase and still do what we blame the police. We'll blame neighbors. We'll blame traffic. Now, this is a justifiable one to me in Atlanta. You can, I think this is a legit one that you should be able to blame traffic. All right. Let's see. We'll blame the weather. You know, well, it, it's raining and I'm in a bad mood. So because it's wet outside makes you in a bad mood. We'll blame the weather. We'll blame that kind of stuff. We'll blame our spouse. Brandy blames me all the time. Okay, anyway. All right. We'll blame friends. And this is the worst one of all. We will blame the devil. The devil made me do it. He made you? Like he physically jumped up? You were the first one to see him and he made you do it? The devil made me do it. We'll blame the devil. And then the last one is, which was the first one inherent in man, We'll blame God. A lot of times we'll blame God. All right? Now, watch this. This is really cool. The closest word to blame in the Greek, if you translate the word blame in the Greek, the closest word we have is the word condemn. They don't use the word blame. They use the word condemn, and it's synonymous with the word blame in the Greek. But in the Hebrew all right, if you look up blame in the Hebrew, guess what word is synonymous with in the Hebrew? Just guess. Take a guess, everybody out there. I know. The word blame in Hebrew is the same word sin. It's the same exact word. Sin and blame are the exact same word in Hebrew. In that deep? Man, I told you we're going somewhere. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless or sinless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Wow. Man. So blame assigns responsibility, not for the situation itself, but for the outcome. Not that you can't 
but that you won't move past. I'm going to say it again. Blame assigns responsibility not for the situation itself, but for the outcome. The reason that's so important is because a lot of times situations that just don't bother us, we don't blame. We don't care about. We, we move on. It doesn't make any difference. It, it, it's irrele- it becomes an irrelevant statement, an irrelevant situation. That's like somebody coming and saying, you know what? You know your wife is not all that attractive. I'm like, dude, you are blind. You've got to be blind. I need to lay hands on you and help you see straight. Okay. So, but, but, <laughs> but, that, but that wouldn't bother me because I'm like, that, that's, a, that's a dumb statement. That's an absolutely crazy statement. It wouldn't bother me at all. Now, there are some other things that somebody may say that may bother me, right? And I will want to blame my reaction on them. That gives them power. That gives them power. And it's not that, that I felt that, that what they said really was abusive. It's I just won't let it go. I won't let it go. I won't move past it. That's what blame does. It says, I'm locked in and refuse to let go. Not that I I can't. I refuse to let it go. I refuse to walk away. I refuse to just just let God have it. I I can't. So I'm going to blame them for my sin. I can move past it, but I refuse to. Mm. Now, there's a term called psychological projection. Psychological projection is a defense mechanism in which the human ego, pride, defends itself against unconscious impulses or qualities, both positive and negative, by denying their existence in themselves while attributing, to the, while attributing them to others. It's a, it's a bl- blame puts you in that same psychological projective position to where you're denying its existence and then attributing it to somebody else. And the blaming personality is very close to a type of narcissist personality, meaning they have an, an, an inflated sense of self who, in their own eyes, can do no wrong. Everything that happens wrong around or to them, whether their own fault or not, is immediately blamed on the other people in their life. All right, so we're going to wrap this up with a couple of things because we hit some pretty good deep points already. Number one, what is a blame shifter? You probably heard that term. Blame shifting is uh, is when a person does something wrong or inappropriate and then dumps the blame on someone else to avoid taking responsibility for their own behavior. Shifting the blame onto others and not taking responsibility results in two things. Our problems never get resolved, and we become weak and ineffective. Now, can you see why the enemy got them to do this? Because immediately they became what? Weak and ineffective. This is true both in natural world and in our spiritual life. Adam not only blamed Eve, but he also blamed God for giving him Eve. Not a smart move. (laughs) Of course, Eve blamed the serpent, and from there, we all know the outcome of the situation. Some people will ask, was man punished because they pointed fingers away from themselves, or the eating of the fruit, or a combination of both? Now, now think about that. What if, what if, instead of pointing fingers, Adam said, I did it. I did it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I did it instead of pointing fingers somewhere else. And in doing so, guess who got the power? The serpent did. The serpent got the power. So we're going to end with these final thoughts. What do you call a person who blames others for their mistakes? Well, there's a term called a scapegoat. A person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, the mistakes or faults of others, especially for reasons you know, that, of, that aren't explained. From this word, we have the word a scapegoater, which means a scapegoater is one that makes a scapegoat of something or somebody else. Now, according to the word, though, there's only one true scapegoat. That was Jesus. 
in Leviticus 16, and I'm, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. No, 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 I'm sorry. Leviticus 16, I'm going to go 1 through 10, okay? The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the, of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they were and when they approached, approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover of the ark or else he's going to die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose, whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. The word atonement means reparations for wrongdoing. It was the day of reparation for wrongdoing or reparation for sin. That's what's going to lead us up to next week because there's only one person, there's only one situation that we actually can legitimately blame. There's only one. We can't blame anything else, but God gives us one. This morning when I got up, he said, I'll let you, I'll give you one. He said, I'll give you one. You can't blame anything else because you can't overcome anything if you choose to. You can walk away from anything if you choose to. I've given you the power to walk away from the curse. I've given you the power to walk away from situations. I've given you the power to be healed and walk away from all circumstances that are inhibiting you. I've given you all that power, but I'll give you one that you can blame it all on. The only thing you can blame it on is the cross. You can blame it on the cross. Think about that. Blame it on the cross. I can't walk in the curse anymore because of the cross. I can't walk in failure anymore because of the cross. I, I can't walk in generational curses anymore because of the cross. I can't blame my parents because of the cross. I can't blame the kids because of the cross. I can't blame society because of the cross. I can't blame traffic. I can't blame the weather for my attitude. I just, I can't, but it's all because of the cross. God can only put blame, watch this, on the cross. Did y'all catch that? I can only nail blame on the cross. I can only nail blame to the cross because that's where my sin belongs on the cross. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Easter Sunday, we're going to talk about how to walk in the healing of blame from the cross. Or as we said, through the eyes of Jesus. Because it was, because it was all nailed on the cross. And oh, I, I, like, I want to give you a sneak peek next week. All right. All right. Okay, just, just a sneak peek. All right, Lord, can I give him just a little hint? Okay, watch this. This is really powerful. On the cross, Jesus' eyes looked at the people, and he took blame away by saying, Father, forgive them. Don't blame them because they don't even know what they're doing. That's how you know blame got taken away on the cross. Man, I'm telling you all, it's going to be good. All right, all right, I won't do the rest of the sermon. But y'all better be here. Easter Sunday, y'all better be here. There's only two times of the year you have to be in church. No, I'm only kidding. All right, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. You get cool points all year for being in Easter Sunday. All right. 
I uh, hope you got a lot out of that. Uh, next week, we're really going to dig into some good stuff, and we're going to walk in some healing. Uh, and then the following week, though, the following Sunday, we're going to talk about, because you notice out of that list, there was one name I left out. There was just one name I left out, and that was you. Many people blame themselves. We'll deal with that one after Easter Sunday. We'll deal with that one after Easter Sunday. How to get delivered from blaming yourself. Told y'all this month it's going to be good. God always does good stuff. All right, let's pray. Father God, I just give you glory and honor and praise. I thank you for today's sermon. Father, that, uh, that we, we begin to open our understanding. It's the best way, Lord. Open our understanding um, that this problem and situation exists, that it's there, that it's inherent, and that it's something that we want to deal with. That we want to be able to go, hey, I can go back through these memories and situations in my life where I wanted to point the finger, where I wanted to blame, where I did point the finger, where I did blame, where I gave somebody else control over me in that situation, and they still have it. Lord, not only did I give it to them, they still have that control. I never got it back because I'm waiting for them to set me free when you have already set me free. And Lord, I'm just operating in that. Lord, that we'll find healing in the cross next week to be able to go through those situations, plead your blood over them, forgive, and walk in freedom, Lord. And then the following week, when we deal with ourselves, the essence of blaming ourselves is selfishness. When we deal with ourselves, Lord, that this month we will walk in so much freedom. Man. It'll be so awesome, Lord. So I thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Father, for everyone who's listening who may not know who you are, we just pray an open heaven over them, that you pour out your love upon them. Lord, that they will reach out to, to those around them who know you or even reach out to us if we can pray for them or help them find a church. Father, so be it, Lord. We just pray a blessing over each person watching. And Father, I thank you for those that are giving the Deep Waters Community Church, Father. Lord, I thank you for those who are still giving, even in this time of restriction. Father, that they're still pouring out, Lord. Father, continue to bless them, replenish them, take care of their homes, Father, replenish their finances. And Lord, right now, I pray for everyone whose job is in jeopardy or has been in jeopardy. Father, I just pray provision be made in the name of Jesus, Lord. That during this time of frustration, that your children will not go hungry, that they will not be starving, and that provision will be made for each one of them, Lord. And as, and as Pastor Brandy said, Lord, that when they come out of this situation, they'll come out better. As, as uh, Pastor Paul talked about in the prophetic word, that during this time, it won't be 40 years, but these 40 days will walk out of there better. Father God, I thank you, Lord, and we just plead the blood of Jesus, as, as Pastor Betsy said, over our doorpost and our home. Father, that Passover will be the time where this thing begins to trend away in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, we proclaim every word. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.